on Svalbard, what you're really getting is skiing in a place unlike anywhere else you'll ski on the planet. It's a combination of sort of wildlife and culture and, and landscape, and it just makes for an unforgettable experience. And these glaciers just stretch for dozens of kilometers inland, and they go right down to the water. Hi, everybody. I'm Rob, and I will talk a little bit about skiing and sailing in Svalbard. We'll talk a little bit about my background, and then we'll dive right into talking about the boat and the skiing and long year as a destination, places like this. I'm an internationally licensed mountain guide, and uh, I studied in the United States. And here in the U.S., we have, I think we're up to about 170 fully licensed international mountain guides now. Just to give you an example, I think France right now has around 1,800 working mountain guides. So um, the culture is not quite the same as it is in the Western European countries, but we're catching up slowly. So I also teach avalanche courses here in the United States. You see that acronym ARI, that's just one of our avalanche providers. It's the largest one in the United States. So I teach level one and two recreational avalanche courses every year. So I did a handful of those in Washington and did a week long one up in Canada, which is my favorite course of the year that I do. I have my own little guide service and then I work for a few others. My little company is called Veta Mountain Guides. And then my father is from Italy. So Veta just means summit in Italian. I kind of like the word. A friend and I started that way back when and now it's mine. And uh, I also have a little journalism career on the side. I've been a writer since leaving university. And so I have a couple books out, the Mountain Guide Manual, the Ski Guide Manual. And I write occasionally for websites like Wild Snow and the powder cloud and things like that. But I'm psyched to be here with 57 Hours. I met these folks right as they were building the app. So I think that was 2017. You see in the background photo there, that's one of the founders, Carmen, who's doing a big jump for joy up at Sunrise Lodge in Canada. That was a great trip. Very cold that week, but it was a really fun trip. But 57 Hours, it's been a great partnership. I was involved from day one and watching them build the app. And so we had all these back and forth talks and emails and things like that. And uh, it's just been really fun watching them expand. And now you can book guides all over the planet with them. So it's been a blast watching my business grow with them. But they split time between Zagreb, Croatia, and New York. And uh, so I get to see the founders. And you can go on 57 Hours and see articles from all over the planet. I've done some stuff about backcountry skiing in Colorado, about rock climbing in the Dolomites. And now every time I go on there, they have new guides and fly fishing and paraponting and all. It's just crazy how popular it's become. That's been a blast working with them. So and so now we'll dive into what we're covering today. We'll talk a little bit about Svalbard as a location and the wildlife there and how you get there and things like that. And then we'll look at our base camp, which is not much of a camp. It's a boat, a big, beautiful boat. So that makes it unique and fun. And then, of course, I'll show you some photos of the skiing and whatnot. We really got lucky in 2019. We just had phenomenal weather, which sometimes it cooperates, sometimes it doesn't. And then we also lucked out and saw a polar bear on that trip. So we'll talk a little bit about that and then just the logistics of putting together a trip in Svalbard. So like I said, Svalbard is way north. So it's actually 79 degrees north latitude. So by the time we go in May, it's 24 hours of daylight. I was planning with a gentleman for that trip in 2019, and he asked me to call him and go over his gear list with him. And I said, sure, absolutely. We were chatting on the phone. And I said, well, you can leave your headlamp at home. And he said to me, oh, no, I like to be prepared and this, that, whatever. And I said, well, that's fine if you want to bring it, but remember, the sun's not going to set. And he sort of laughed and said, oh, yeah, I forgot. We're way up north, and that first night you wake up and peer out the porthole on the boat or go up top or uh, you're staying in the hotel, you'll be surprised. It looks like it's the middle of the day, so it's interesting. But it's a unique spot up there, and there's great wildlife, and Svalbard itself is really interesting in terms of the human history there as well. We'll talk about these poor forgotten Russian coal miners and I'll show you a couple of photos of those places. There is one of my favorite photos from our trip in uh, 19, my friend Becky skiing right there. This is a wonderful day. We got a couple of nice runs. It's just a phenomenal landscape. You top out on these little peaks. It's glaciers as far as you can see right down to Blue Ocean. It was just really, really cool. Just was so excited to go back. There's our boat that we were using in 19. Now my trip is coming up in a couple of weeks. It'll be on sort of the sister boat to this one. It's slightly bigger. The boat you see here is called the Nordelect, which means Northern Lights. And I'll be on the Rembrandt, which is just a little bit bigger here, but you can see it's a big, beautiful sailboat. We just had a blast. This is skiing up to the boat. So you can see the smaller little Zodiac inflatable there takes us from the sea ice back to the boat every day. It was just a total blast. You know, right here, you're skinning on sea ice. A month or two after this photo was taken, that's just open water. 
part of the reason we go this time of year is because most of the ocean is now ice free and you can sail around and get to the good skiing, but there's still plenty of snow to go touring on. So you really have this nice window, May into the beginning of June, where the boat can get where we need to go and the skiing is still pretty good. Later in the year, you have hiking trips there and things like that, where people are walking on tundra and vegetation and things like that. But this time of year, when we go in May, is really nice because it's still an icy, beautiful landscape like that. So if you look at that little projection, that map over there, you can see uh, Norway is highlighted in red. And then Svalbard is a collection of islands that it's technically part of Norway. And there's some interesting agreements about the Russians are still there. They have a couple of these little coal mines that I think back in the day were a little busier. And now they just keep them running largely so they don't have to go back and clean them up. But uh, you can see Svalbard is way up there at the northern tip of Greenland, almost to the North Pole. So Longyear, the capital Longyear Bind, is at 79 degrees north. And then on a lucky year, you can sail way up to maybe 80. 384 degrees north, way around the north side of the island. And it's 60% glaciated. Longyear is the northernmost permanently inhabited city on the planet. And there's 2,500 people all on Svalbard, most of whom are in Longyear. There are a couple of research stations around the island. You do have a few other people in other places, but not very many, mainly there in Longyear, which is a fun little town. And there's uh, three to 4,000 polar bears still up there. So more bears than people, but they're spread out pretty good. So it's a rarity to see them. There's a close up map. You can see Spitsbergen is the largest island of this chain of islands. Some people will call the whole collection Svalbard. And then the individual little islands, you know, will have their names. You can see long years right in the middle there. And then you see Barentsburg is one of these little Russian coal mining towns, as is Pyramiden. Pyramiden is largely abandoned, but Barentsburg has still got a bar and a hotel. And wow, I'll tell you, it is a different world up there. And you can see, you know, way, way up north. We didn't get up there, but there's a bunch of the island way up north that it would just be a blast to get to someday. So we'll see. But let's talk a little bit about the boat. Like I said, some of the photos you'll see here are from the Nordelect, which is still a 50 meter long boat. It's beautiful. It was originally built in 1909, I think. It has subsequently been restored. You can see just a spectacular landscape. The ocean's gorgeous. You see whales out there. We saw walruses, seals, bunches of different kinds of seabirds. We saw a couple of Arctic foxes, which is really neat. I mean, it was just a magical trip. The skiing is really fun, but if someone wanted to just go ski powder somewhere on the planet, I would say, oh, come to Canada, go to British Columbia, or maybe you meet me in Japan or something like this. On Svalbard, what you're really getting is skiing in a place unlike anywhere else you'll ski on the planet. And it's a combination of sort of wildlife and culture and, and landscape, and it just makes for an unforgettable experience. Here you can see sort of a, a typical day where we might leave the boat and get onto land. Occasionally you land right on the shore, but often we'll take the little boat into the sea ice. So you can see our track coming up way down in the distance over sea ice and then onto a glacier. And now we're up on the side of a peak and that's our group traveling uphill there. And then the photo on the right is my friend King. I just happened to look down at him and uh, it was just unreal looking at, I mean, these glaciers just stretch for you know, dozens of kilometers inland and they go right down to the water. I mean, it's just really an unbelievable landscape. And so I, I must have shot, geez, I don't know, a thousand photos or something. I think they were, I probably overdid it a little bit that first year. It was pretty cool. Many of these peaks haven't been uh, skied before. And that was just an unbelievable experience. This is my friend, Dan. He is really an adventurer and has traveled all over the planet. It was fun to be in a, in an exotic place with him just because he skied so many different places. You know, it was fun watching him uh, sort of get a wow out of the trip as well, just because he's been to so many cool places himself. We must have skied on, geez, 2% of the landscape we saw. It was just so neat. And that same picture of my friend Becky, she was a really strong skier from Calgary or Edmonton, I can't remember, in Canada. But it was a really fun group of Canadians with us and they were just all superstar skiers. Onto these peaks from the boat, the tallest peaks that we summited were maybe 1,200 meters or so, three, three and a half thousand feet. So you would climb for a couple, three hours in some cases, and then you could get a couple really fun runs up high and two or three runs if you were in a little bit of the faster group. Some groups just did one run and then did a nice tour around some of the glacier and the sea ice below. We do a run and then get back down to the sea ice and we end up back at the boat and then uh, the chef will have a snack for us. Everybody has time to take a hot shower, relax, and then we have dinner together and then we wake up the next day and do it again. So it's a pretty fun itinerary to get into. We spend the first couple of days in town in Longyear and then we get on the boat for a week. It's a really fun routine and then we 
Typically we'll relocate every evening. So you'll have dinner and then we'll sail to a new spot, anchor in that bay, and then they'll go skiing the next day as well. So it makes for a pretty fun week. It's like a Canadian hut trip, except that you're changing locations every night and you're on a boat instead of in a warm lodge. So it's pretty neat. So we'll talk a little bit more about the skiing, look at some specifics. Like most of the time we were on skis. I mean, there's a few little sections where we took skis off and had to boot up something. But for the most part, you can skin uh, most places here. There are some steeper peaks and whatnot, but uh, really beautiful climbs. And uh, on the nicer days, like you can see right there, you just have these unbelievable ocean views. And we say in American English, choose your own adventure, meaning you can get off the boat, kind of look at a a mountaintop or two, and one group can say, oh, we'll go up to this one. And the other group can tour to to an adjacent peak. We, as the guides, keep in touch with one another and to have radios between ourselves and the boat. And so we know where everybody is and what we're doing, but we compare notes and talk about what kind of skiing we're seeing and avalanche hazard and things like this. But it just makes for a really fun experience because we get to see so much different terrain. You can see Patrick, again, he was a super skier as well, but you can see we really tracked up this slope. So we, I think we got three runs on this slope. You can see our up track right above uh, Patrick right there. You can see the boat down way, it's out of the photo on the left, but while we're skiing, you can see the boat way down there. So as soon as you're done, you just point the skis downhill and you can slide back to the coast. So it really makes for a neat ski and another nice shot there. That's me, I think, I'm pretty sure. You can often tell the guides because you see it looks like I have an antenna or something coming up above my head, and that's actually a rifle. Each of the guys will have a rifle, and then we have a naturalist liaison on the boat as well who helps us talk about wildlife and geology and things like that. He's really this well-informed, fun uh, English fella. Very off chance you run into a bear, you do have to have some protection with you, but we saw a bear but from a safe distance, so it was really just an amazing experience. But... And then getting back down to the coast, you get to be a little bit careful down by the water. The bears are mostly along the coast. And so skiing back down, you see right here, we ski in a place where we can see below us and uh, pay attention to what we're skiing down on top of because you wouldn't want to come down there and surprise a mother bear with two little cubs or something like that. That might get sketchy pretty quick. So, and then we're back on the sea ice. We coordinate with the boat and radio ahead and say, oh, we'll be over at the water in an hour or two, something like that. And then they send the, the little raft and run us over to the boat in groups of five or six or so. So it really is a deluxe day. The boat crew does all the work. The chef is in the kitchen and the boat captain is this fun fella named Floris. And he has two uh, mates that help him with the sails and running the boat and doing all this. So it just turns into such a fun experience and really relaxing for all of us. Even the guides, I, you know, we're working hard when we're out there skiing, but once you get back there, you get a hot shower and things like that. It really is pretty fun, enjoyable. So for those of you that are interested in talking a little bit about the snow, typically it's more of a spring snowpack. So not nearly as much soft powder wintertime snow, and it transitions into more springtime skiing or what we say in American English, corn skiing. But we did have one evening, there was like 10 centimeters of new snow on shadier aspects. There's a bit less sun to the north, not much, but, and so there was a tiny bit of powder skiing on those aspects in the morning because the sun hadn't come around onto them yet. But in general, it's spring skiing. So for folks in Europe, it'd be uh, similar to what you're finding on the Haute Route or something like that. I just saw some friends down in Lofoten and it looked like the ski conditions were still pretty good. So as I said, there are polar bears out on Svalbard. There's tons of other wildlife as well. We, it seemed like every day we were trying to figure out a bird that we had seen, or we had the binoculars out. We had seen walruses, seals, Arctic foxes. They were really these cute little tiny little foxes that went running by. And it's that time of the year where they're starting to lose some of their winter fur. And they look like these scruffy or skinny little miniature foxes. They were really cool. But the big attraction up there are the polar bears, right? So you can see that's a polar bear track heading off into the distance right there. And the polar bears mainly feed on seals. So you will often see these tracks walking between seal holes. The seals have holes in the ice where they come up and uh, they'll sun themselves on a nice day and sort of lay around. And the bears are hoping, I think, that they can surprise one of these seals. So from above, when we're way up on the side of a peak, we're often looking down and before we get back there and the boat captain is watching out and we're looking out, A, to, in the hopes we get to see a bear at a safe distance, but B, we want to make sure too we don't surprise a bear or get surprised ourselves. We're often chatting back and forth, but from up on the side of the peaks, you can look down and you'll see these tracks going between seal holes. So that is my glove right there. So that's just an average size 
man ski glove right there. You can see the footprint from that bear is awfully big. I'm assuming it had been refrozen a couple times, so maybe it looks a little bigger. But it's just an enormous animal. You know, we were assured there was no way we were going to run into one that was really, really rare and this kind of stuff. We ended up seeing this bear. It was just a fun, a little bit nervous situation because we were on foot still on the ice. Now, I took this photo from the boat, but as we were getting back down to the ice, we had radioed ahead to the boat captain and said we were coming back down and I let him know. And then when we got down there onto the sea ice, right as we were about a kilometer from the water, the boat captain came back on the radio and said, Robert, there is a polar bear right where I left you this morning. And so we all sort of paused and said, okay. And so we started skiing around to a different pickup spot looking for the bear at the same time we wanted to see him but also trying to have a you know safe distance between us and the bear and then eventually the bear turned and started coming our direction so he got oh i don't know maybe 300 meters away 250 meters and so we stopped and grouped up and i think eventually the bear probably smelled us took off going the other direction he didn't like how we smelled apparently is there any chance he can go up on two paws for us So once we got back on the boat, the bear um, gave us enough space we could all get in the raft. And you saw that was just a little quick phone video there. Once we got back on the boat, we watched this bear for probably 45 minutes. And he must have covered 10 or so kilometers just walking around to seal holes and having to poke around. He didn't seem at all stressed by us. He kept his distance from us. We obviously stayed away from him and stayed a bit quiet. You know, I was with friends that I had skied with all over the planet. And that's my buddy Cooper right there. Cooper is an avid hunter back in North America. And I said, you know, hey, Cooper, if the bear got any closer, I would have handed you the rifle because he's an avid hunter. And, you know, I go target shooting uh, just to stay prepared. But Cooper's really a crack shot with his uh, rifle. You know, we were right there together. And it was just such a magical experience to see that bear close up and uh, have it be safe for everybody. I think what the bear was originally attracted to, you can't see it in this photo, but there were two Norwegian young guys who were out there sleeping in a tent and they were hunting seals. You can still apparently hunt seals in Norway. And they had killed a seal or two. And then they had the seals right next to their tent. And they also had a dog. So seals, if you've ever been around them, are really, really smelly. They don't smell very good. And I think the pair was attracted to these two young Norwegian guys, seals. You can just see there's the landscape. We had skied back in one of those valleys on top of one of those peaks and then uh, came back and got to watch the bear that evening. It was such a cool day. While we're out skiing, one of the things that was a big adjustment for me is having to ski with this rifle. And uh, you can see here we were all at the top of this peak having lunch and I'm over to the side. And uh, so one of the things I was doing was anywhere the group would stop, I would stop over on the side and put down my pack and the rifle pointing the other direction just to practice good firearm safety. It was definitely a, a, a new experience for me is having to worry about having a gun along and keeping the gun dry and doing all this kind of stuff. But we just had such a cool afternoon watching that bear. The boat captain, my friend Flory, said, you're going to come back to Svalbard another five or six years before you see another bear. Like you have no idea how lucky you were seeing a, a bear for your first trip there. So it was pretty magical. We took off every morning after that, hoping we were going to see a bear, but we didn't again. We saw plenty of tracks. Like you can see right here, there's another bear track crossing my ski track right there, but it was pretty neat. But that was sort of the highlight of the trip. I would say the skiing was wonderful. The food was a blast. Sailing that boat around in the Arctic was so cool, but really the polar bear for me was uh, one of the more memorable things. So like I said, this coming year, we'll be on a boat called the Rembrandt. It's slightly bigger. I think we have 27 people on board total. So three crew, four guides, and then 20 something guests. There is a photo and you can see it's like, a, it's quite a big sailboat. And there was one evening where we got to put all the sails up. I, I grew up in Colorado in the United States, which has big lakes, but that is it. We have mountains and no ocean. So being on a boat this big for me was quite a, a new experience, but getting to put the sails up and watching how they rig all the sails and do all this, it was, I mean, just unbelievable how much work goes into it. And then we got to sail for several hours under a full sail. And, you know, I was out on deck just sort of loving it the whole time. It was really, really neat. But that's the boat we'll be on. And it's a reinforced hull now. So it sails around in the Arctic and they do, you know, there is ice in the water and things like that. So the boat has been reinforced and uh, adapted. So it's a little more seaworthy. It's over a hundred years old now. On the boat, we have a couple of these Zodiacs, we call them in English. 
And that's just this inflatable rubber raft. And that's how we get to and from shore with groups of four or five or six or so. There's our, what we call the liaison Phil Wickens. This is this English gent that's, I think he spent maybe 30 summers up in the Arctic. He just knows every inlet and every animal. He's really a, a fun guy to go skiing with. And he's an avid climber and a skier, and he goes down to Antarctica as well. So I think he loves these cold places that we visit. But he really added to the trip just so much knowledge about the wildlife, the geology, and the history of Svalbard. There was really, Europeans were the first one to go up there. There was not an Inuit or Scandinavian or any kind of Laplander presence or anything on Svalbard that they can detect. And I think the first mention of a place called Svalbard was around 1100. And somebody described it, a European, as four days sailing from Iceland. So they had obviously knew something was up there. It was not really settled by uh, humans until much, much later. So there's that boat captain I was telling you about, Floris. He's this super fun Dutch guy. And boy, he has got a million stories to tell. It was just so fun spending time on the deck with him and talking to him about sailing in storms and the boat and this and that. And he owns the Nordelect. And he was just really proud of his boat and kind of loved talking about it and, and showing you things that he had fixed and done and all this. So he's a neat guy. And he's based down in the Netherlands and you know goes up to the Arctic in the summer and sails his boat up there. So it was really cool. He sails us around into these inlets. You can see one of these um, bays right here. And he really, between him and Phil Wickens, they figure out which uh, bays they can get into and where they can anchor safely and based on the weather and what the sea ice is doing. And then they coordinate where we're going to ski during the day with the guides. And so we say, oh, this peak looks nice or the snow is doing this. Let's be here or there. And so between all of that, they figure out where we can go. And then they get us to and from shore and do that safely, you know, help us have the best time we can have. This is 2019. Again, you can see these pieces of sea ice, you know, as the sea ice retreats into the Arctic summer, the sea ice breaks up and then eventually melts, things like that. And that first night on the boat, I kept hearing tapping on the hull and I was trying to go to sleep and I was sleeping in the same berth as my buddy, Tom. And I finally whispered, Hey Tom, what's that sound? And it was sea ice like this, just coming up next to the boat and just tapping against the hull all night. That was the first thing I had to get ready, sort of accustomed to, so I could fall asleep. Later, maybe the second or third night, we heard this very strange, high-pitched, almost whistling sound. It would start really high-pitched and then descend in tone. And this kept going for five or 10 minutes. And I did the same thing. I said, hey, Tom, what is that sound? And it was the sound of whales communicating with one another. And you hear it through the hull of the boat. I mean, I was just blown away by this being, you know, like I said, having grown up in Colorado and you, you just have no sense of how these things work on the ocean. And it was just, you know, you're really just in a whole nother world. And so by the end of the week, you're just accustomed to this pace and getting on the little boat and onto the sea ice and back and forth and things like this. So we're climbing down into these little boats in ski boots, which can be a little nerve wracking for me at first. And then also having our guests do that back and forth. It's just such a unique new ski experience that I just, man, I was raving about it. And when my friend Tom went for the first time, I mean, from the middle of the trip, he wrote me an email and said, you've got to come here. We're going next year. This is incredible. You can't believe it. I'm sort of on the same uh, program now. I just can't say enough fun stuff about it. And like I said, every night we get back on the boat, eat some dinner, and then typically we'll change locations. So we'll go to a new bay or fjord or a new place to ski. And everybody gets bundled up and comes out there and just sort of enjoys another hour or two on the deck if it's not uh, too rainy or snowy or whatever we're doing. And then we'll go to another place. You can see that's Flory's steering the boat right there. I mean, it's just an incredible vessel. It seemed like every day I, I did or saw something that was really new to me. So I'm, I'm excited to go back. And it sounds like they've had a good year snow-wise. So I think on the glaciers, the crevasses will be filled in and the skiing should be pretty darn good. While we're in the capital of Longyear for a couple of days before the voyage. And so for guests that choose to book early, we get a hotel for a couple nights and we tour around a town there long year, but there's a bunch of other stuff to do. So I always encourage people, Hey, if you want to show up a little early or stay an extra day or two, you can certainly do that. I don't think you'd, you'd regret it. It's not, Svalbard is not going to be big in terms of uh, a big destination in terms of shopping or art or things like this. Like uh, it's not like going to Rome or Vienna or uh, Oslo or something, but it does have a bunch of cool stuff to do that uh, you won't find in these other places. So 
I've talked a little bit about these coal mining towns. So this is a scene in Ferencburg. That's Tom walking up there from the boat and you walk through town. Now you see all this dark, what looks like dirt or soil on the ground. This is actually coal dust. There's a couple uh, places in Svalbard that had coal deposits, Pyramid and uh, Ferencburg being the two most well-known. Pyramid is now largely abandoned, but Barentsburg still has this tiny little coal mine that is producing, I don't know, it must be hundreds of kilos of coal a day, not very much. And they have this one little truck running loads in and out of there, and these are Russians running this mine. So when Svalbard formally became part of Norway, part of the treaty granting it to Norway was that several other countries, Russia, England, maybe France, would still have access to the natural resources there. So the Russians, for some reason, have continued to mine in this town in Barentsburg. And so you walk into Barentsburg and there's a statue of Vladimir Lenin. There are buildings with Russian on them. There was a huge community center with a pool and all these things, totally abandoned at this point. But the signs are in Cyrillic and in, in uh, Russian. I mean, you're walking around, you don't see a single person. And we found the bar and went inside. It was full. And uh, there was a skier festival happening up there. So it was just an absolutely crazy, bizarre experience. And you go up to the bar and the bartenders are Russian. It was uh, yet another thing in Svalbard that I just couldn't believe. So if the weather works, we often will go down to Barentsburg and stop there. And just this year that I was there, um, it just happened to work out right. We got a good ski day in right around there. And we could spend the night there and go out to the bar. And people from all over the world there who had also arrived on another boat. And it, it was fun hanging out with them. And, you can also go dog sledding right out of Long Year. There are operations right outside of town where they have all the dogs and the sleds and things like this. I didn't get to do it. My wife is a total dog lover. So I went out there one evening and took photos of the dogs. In the United States, we call them Alaskan Huskies, which is just a sort of a breed of dog that is a bunch of breeds together that they have developed because they do really well in the snow and they're strong and things like that. So they look similar to that, a bit like a a husky and a malamute and they're all sort of blended together but these dogs are crazy and they love running with the sleds so when they see the sleds come out they they all start barking and and uh, having a blast and so you, you can go out um, i think they do overnight trips as well you can go way out under the ice cap and sleep in a tent or you can just go out for a couple hours something like that and there's a photo of one of the operations of the dog sledding places you can see those little houses are obviously the dog houses and you can see a couple of the dogs out there and then they have, you know, bigger places where they store the sleds and things like this. But when it's feeding time and the people come out to feed the dogs, they all come out of their little houses and then they start barking and they're chained up because I think they will fight and get into trouble at, at different times. So they have a chain on and they can move around their house and kind of hang out, but they can't just roam freely. When they come out to feed them, the dogs go crazy and start barking and yipping and all this stuff. It was a funny scene to see all these uh, dogs. They all look pretty darn happy too. They seem like they love what they're doing. So... And there's just a bunch of other stuff you can do. When we're up there, unfortunately, it's 24 hours of daylight, so we don't get to see the Northern Lights. But if you are ever anywhere near like mainland Europe, you can get up there pretty easily in February or March. And I just was reading an article about this. I guess we're now heading into several years where there's going to be more activity with the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis. So I've seen them a couple times in Alaska, not super bright, but I guess Svalbard is one of the really cool places you can see them midwinter. So that would be a fun trip to do if you're over there already at a different time of year. But you can also go up on the glacier and get down into inside the glacier. You can see that's my friend Frank on the right walking in one of these tubes inside the glacier. If you're claustrophobic, it's not going to be your cup of tea, but it was pretty neat to be down sort of in the guts of the glacier. There's great uh, wildlife viewing up there, the whales, it really anything to do with Arctic ecology. I mean, the, there's caribou, there's unbelievable plants that spend most of the year under ice. And then they get this one or two months during the summer where they come out and bloom and uh, these beautiful little wildflowers and things. And uh, great sea kayaking. You can go out on these snowmobiles. You can do an overnight on a snowmobile if you want. And then there's several research stations all over the, the islands, one of which is Polish. And one of my great friends in Chamonix, Pavel Kunikovich went to Svalbard 20 years ago and they went to Long Year and then towed sleds across one of the ice caps to a Polish research station, said hello to the crew there, and then they turned around and skied back. So it took them several days, but it looked like quite the adventure. But there's a ton of stuff to do there. There's been some pretty cool articles over the last few years. If you're interested, you could Google them and find them with some beautiful wildlife photography and talking about other stuff to do. So getting there for North Americans, usually that means 
getting to Oslo, maybe Stockholm. Seems like there are two or three flights a week from Oslo. So you got to be a little strategic about getting a flight from Oslo and, and getting up there. If you're already in Europe, yeah, you get yourself to Oslo or Stockholm. SAS will fly out of Stockholm and Norwegian Air out of, out of Oslo. Down on the left there, that's Oslo, which I just I thought was a fabulous city. And I had a couple of days there. I thought it was really cool. You fly the whole length of Norway and then you fly out over the Arctic Ocean and land in Longyear. That's the town sign there on the upper left. I think it's the smallest airport I've ever been to, maybe. But you walk out and you see on the signs there, you can see there's a warning about polar bears. And then they've got these distances to all these other places. You know, it's 5,500 kilometers to New York there and 11,000 kilometers to Brazil and whatnot. But we had rented a van and they just leave you the van out in the parking lot with the keys sitting in it. First, I thought it was a little crazy. And then someone reminded me there's only whatever it is, maybe 20 or 30 kilometers of roads around long year, like if someone stole a van, there would be nowhere to go. So it makes sense. The ski touring is like any ski trip you might've done in Europe. We do ski on glaciers. So people bring harnesses, you know, and a locking carabiner and one of those slings. We insist everyone brings ski crampons. So you'll see down there under basic ski mountaineering, we, we bring ski crampons, uh, but not boot crampons typically. And most people will bring a helmet as well. The snow surface is uh, pretty firm in the spring. So I skied around in a helmet most of the week as well. I don't think we're going to bring boot crampons or ice axes this year. It sounds like it's been pretty snowy. So we bring ski crampons, a harness, things like that for the actual skiing. You know, in our usual safety stuff, a beacon, shovel, and a probe, a ski touring backpack with a, you know, a big puppy jacket in it. But then on the boat, it's nice to have a pair of shoes to walk around. So maybe a pair of wool slippers or something like that. That's what I brought last year just when you're inside. If it's storming out... Most people don't want to be out on the top side anyway, if it's raining and snowing. So, but there are a few pair of boots and things like that that you could uh, wear if you go out on the deck or if you had to, you could put on ski boots and go out there or whatever. And there is a drying room in the boat. So if you come back, we, we do have a place to dry gloves and boots and things like that right when you get back on the boat. And then I always remind people to bring their earplugs anytime you're on a hot trip or on a, you know, one of these trips where you have a lot of people sleeping in the same place. If you get somebody who snores and then a puffy jacket you see at the bottom. So that's what we, in American English, we call it a puffy jacket, meaning just one of these big down parkas you can throw on. It's very, very humid, obviously, because you're right on the ocean and you're way far north. So when it's cold, it's really cold. And so a big puffy jacket can be nice. I definitely got a lot out of mine when I was there. I guess there are flights from Tromso, which is on that north coast of uh, Norway, up in the Lingen Alps. You can get a flight there. I think they're fairly infrequent. Trip insurance is a great idea. Be really careful about the exclusions with COVID and travel and all this. We just had a friend coming on this trip who unfortunately injured his knee. So he's trying to get his trip covered right now. And unfortunately, the insurance companies don't make it easy all the time. I do something that I purchase carbon offsets. I did some research, this company called TerraPass seems to be about as good a an offset program as you can find. And so I go in there and you tell them, I do this for my business for the whole year. Actually, I try to keep track of how much I've driven a car and flown in airplanes. And then I try to do that. Climate change is definitely affecting Svalbard negatively. It's something I choose to do. So I, I kind of gently suggest it to everybody who comes. And I hope, you know, a few people will do it. In terms of the training, the like I said, the peaks are around... 800 to 1200 meters high, you know, they're between 2,800 feet and 3,800 feet. We have enough guides in the boat this year on the Rembrandt. I think we'll have four guides. There's an Italian coming. I haven't met him yet, worked with him, but he seems like a nice guy. Some Canadians and I will be there. And so we can split into groups. And so if you want to do a longer group, we can, you know, have a few people that say, hey, I want to be out all day and do a couple peaks. We can certainly do that. Short days, you know, you could just want a casual day or maybe the weather's not very good. You could be out for just a few hours. Our longest day would be seven or eight hours. The shortest day I would think would be a couple, three hours unless it's really raining or something and people just don't even want to ski. And that's an option too. You know, you don't have to leave the boat every day. So that's kind of an overview of, you know, how much we're out in training. So if you're hiking a little bit and doing some running and if you're in a place where you can ski all year, then, you know, that'll give me an idea about that. So here's a little bit of info about the specifics of the trip itself. If you come for the days in long year, then your, your trip will stretch to like 10 days or so. But you can also just be on the boat, and then that's seven days on the boat. So this year uh, on the boat will be May 22nd to May 29th as an example. You can see our dates for 2023 right there. And we'll have three different voyages. And then depending on 
how Tom and I feel about being away from home and how many clients we have and all that. Like I could be there for all three of those. I might only be on one or two of them. We'll just see. We have 17 or so people on the trips that are on the Nordelict. There's a few more than that on the Rembrandt. So those trips that you see next year, there's a couple of those on the Nordelict and one is on the Rembrandt. That price covers everything. Basically, once you get to long year, it covers the hotel and then the boat, your guides, the food, any of these fees that we incur with the Norwegians, harbor fees and stuff like that. And uh, we provide lunches when you get out ski touring, but there's breakfast and dinner on the boat. Plenty of coffee starting at 6.30 in the morning. The guides are up there doing guide meetings and things like that. You know, it covers everything. So you can book through 57 hours and Maya and the team will help you out. And if you need to talk to me, they can connect you with me. Hopefully everybody has a great spring ski season and whatnot and a super summer. And I'll see you all soon.